first of all, it's a great privilege to be here with so many friends. I mean, to see a lot of familiar faces here and, and to be sitting next to Jake Tapper, who did write a brilliant book uh, called The Outpost, you know, which is the experience of multiple units over time in a particular geographic area in Afghanistan. It's a book that I think brings out you know, elements of the enduring nature of, of combat. So I thought what I might just offer up front is, is, uh, are some thoughts about how the Army's thinking about future war. But first, I just want to thank Peter. I want to thank uh, General Frankly, you know, really ASU and, and uh, you know, and this tremendous organization for bringing together a, a, uh, a, a great group of experts to talk about, I think, a really important problem, which is the problem of, of future armed conflict. And I think it's an important, a particularly timely um, conference because of the threats that we can see so clearly to international security and national security. And I, and I think those threats, I think we can identify them as, as coming both from really nation states, adversarial states, uh, as well as non-state actors. And, and the emergence of what so, so many have, have called really this hybrid threat of really the confluence between networked insurgent and terrorist type organizations now bridging over into transnational organized crime networks, but tied to nation states and really having access to capabilities that, that they didn't have access to in the past. And so we're fighting these so-called hybrid enemies and, and networked organizations that have capabilities previously associated only with the fielded forces of nation states. And, and those capabilities, as we know, involve communications, the ability to mobilize resources, the, the, uh, the, and access to very destructive uh, technologies. And so it's a very important time because we are at risk, I think. Uh, we are at risk by the various groups that we see in the greater Middle East, and ISIL in particular these days, uh, who are advancing a medieval, uh, anti-Western, uh, anti-human, I would say, ideology, uh, and are, in fact, the enemies of all civilized people. And we also see other developments today, such as, as Russia's actions in, in Ukraine, where they're using unconventional forces under the cover of conventional forces to change the, 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 geogra the geopolitical landscape in, 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 uh, in Europe and, and to, to change, really, the, 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 uh, the, the, the balance of power on the Eurasian landmass. So, so these, are just, these are just a couple of examples. So super important conference, so glad that, that, that to be able to participate in it. And, and I think what I just might say up front is I think how we think about future war is vitally important. And if we think about really how to think about future war, I think really about two, two main observations. The first is that we have to balance both continuity in the nature of war with change in the character of warfare and maybe not confuse the two. I think when we get in trouble is when we neglect continuities in the nature of war. War is an extension of politics, war is human dimension, war is in inherent or imminent uncertainty based on the continuous interaction with the enemy and, a ver and these very complex environments uh, based on politics and the human dimension. And then war is a contest of wills. And so we have to think about continuity uh, and, and do what, what the historian Carl Becker said. He said, the memory of the past and the anticipation of the future should walk hand in hand in a happy way. And so, as we think about changes in, in, in the character of warfare, I think we ought, we ought to, to do it in the way that Sir Michael Howard uh, suggested. Think about war and warfare in width, depth, and in context. In width over time, so you can see changes over time and, and understand both you know, possibilities and limitations, for example, of technology. Look at conflict in depth, like Jake's book on the outpost, where you look at a very sp specific area and a campaign in depth, and then sort of the tidy outlines of, of war from an academic perspective kind of dissolve, and you see war as it is, right, chaotic, profoundly human, and then to consider war in context, context of what we have to achieve politically in armed conflict context of, uh, of, of the military's role in, in society, context of, of really a society's will and how we generate and sustain the will to confront increasingly determined, brutal, and capable enemies and adversaries. So, so I think the two things I would just stress is continuity and change and thinking about war and warfare in width, depth, and context as Sir Michael Howard recommended. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, um, and thank you so much for, for having me, and it's especially an honor to be uh, talking to Lieutenant General uh, McMaster. I want to read something to you and get your reaction to it. In Iraq and Afghanistan, gaps between prior visions of future warfare and the nature of the eventual wars themselves complicated efforts to adapt strategy over time. Minimalist linear plans in place at the outset of both wars were disconnected 
from the ambition of broader policy objectives and the complexity of the operating environment. Indeed, recent war plans have at times been essentially narcissistic, failing to account for interactions with determined enemies and other complicating variables. In extreme cases, plans were based on the assumption that a war would end with the disengagement of one party to the conflict. The author is you. Uh, what do you mean by narcissistic? <laughs> What I mean is that we, d we, tend, we tend to define the problem of war and warfare in relation to us and what we would like to do, and also in relation to how we would like war to be. And so what typically you hear when we neglect continuities in the nature of war is really, really, the next war will be fundamentally different from all wars that have gone before it. And it's typically due to an overpromise of technology, technological advantages, whether it is in the 1990s, you know, the so-called revolution in military affairs and the orthodoxy associated with what became the defense transformation movement, right? Remember, future wars gonna, were gonna be fast, cheap, efficient. We were gonna conduct something called rapid, decisive operations, you know, which is sort of like the George Costanza approach to where you just leave on a high note, right? You just go and do some military things and then leave. And then, uh, and then, and then the language was hubristic in, in, in large measure because we, we didn't give agency to the enemy, right? So this is one of those continuities in the nature of wars. Wars uncertainty because of its political and human dimensions, but, but wars uncertainly is uncertain fundamentally because of the continuous action with determined enemies, right? Who, you know, who, who really uh, are, are adapting continuously, who are evolving conflicts in ways that you don't understand at the outset. And so recognizing that interaction with the enemy then I think leads to a more humble sort of uh, understanding of what you can achieve through technological prowess. And I think for the U.S. military in particular, what we have to take from that example, really, I think that setup of that ideology to, and defense you know, theory of the 90s for the difficulties we encountered in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, we have to recognize that, that we have to learn lessons from that. And so I would say that we can learn quite a bit. It's, as I mentioned up front, this is an important time for this conference because of the threats we see emerging to international and national security. It's also an important time because we have a tremendous opportunity to consolidate lessons of 13 years of war. And, and you know, there's an old saying, hey, the military, you know, they're always ready to fight the last war. Well, really, if you look, if you look at historically at military experience, those who were least prepared for the war that they embark upon were those who studied the last war only superficially. And so I think what we have to really do is, is, study, uh, is study our most recent experiences. And I think one of, the, one of the things we relearned was that we have to pay adequate attention to continuities in the nature of war. And it's important for planning in wars, right, so that, so that you're, you're undertaking military operations, conducting military operations to get to sustainable outcomes consistent with your vital interests, that you're acknowledging that your enemies are going to fight against you in ways you may, may not expect. You know, Conrad Crane said, hey, there are two ways Two ways to fight the U.S. military, right? Asymmetrically and stupid. Now, if you, you, know, you may want to hope that people pick stupid, but they likely will not. And so, the, so the, the key is, how do you seize, retain, exploit the initiative over the enemy? How do you continuously adapt? And so that's important for, for conducting campaigns, conducting operations in war, but it's also important in between wars. And I'd say we're not really in between wars right now, but, but if one day we are in between wars, that we have to recognize that in between wars, we interact with, with potential adversaries as well. And so if we take this narcissistic approach, you know, and we, and we, we, we define an objective, hey, here's where we're going to be in the future. Remember in the 1990s, some of the language was that we're just going to be so darn good, so capable, that we will lock the enemy out of the market of future conflict. They won't even mess with us, we'll be so bad, you know? And so, of course, if you, if you, if you bank on a narrow suite of, of capabilities and, and technological advantage as the principal element of your differential advantage over future enemies, your enemies are gonna figure it out. They're gonna figure out how to bypass that strength. So what's American military power? American military power, first of all, is joint power. It's using land, air, maritime, now cyber forces, space together. It's how we combine things in this game of rock, paper, scissors, you know, which is war. And, and, and American, I think American's dis differential advantage over the enemy has to do with skilled soldiers and teams, skilled sailors, airmen, marines, and teams with, tech, with multiple technologies that give us that differential advantage. There are three conflicts going on right now that almost could have been taken from a, a war textbook, perhaps written by you five years ago, um, ISIS, Ukraine, right. North Korea. And I'm wondering how you think 
we could have, if you could go back in that time machine and better prepare, how could we be better fighting ISIS? I'll, yeah. do, I'll do each one of them one by one, but how, yeah. it doesn't feel as though the United States and the coalition are even close to really posing a significant challenge uh, to the rise of ISIS in Syria and Iraq, and indeed throughout from Algeria to Afghanistan. Right. Okay. So you gave three, I think, great examples of, of the complexity of war, right? And, and, uh, and, and I think the, one of the main lessons from the experience in the greater Middle East broadly and the catastrophe that's happening there, uh, and, and uh, this, uh, this applies to, you know, to our experience in Iraq, is that in, in Iraq, um, the competition with our enemies was very complicated because of the, the political and, and the human drivers of that conflict. And so what it was important for us I think in a period of time during which we adapted to the way that campaign had evolved was to understand what was driving that conflict politically and develop a political strategy as the foundation for all other activities to be able to address those drivers of the, of the conflict. And so in Iraq, I think it's a great study to look at the evolution of a conflict over time. From what was initially a decentralized, localized hybrid insurgency that coalesced over time an insurgency for which we weren't prepared because we didn't plan for anything really beyond unseating the regime. Or we didn't plan adequately, I think is, is, is fair to say. And so as, as a result, that some of the actions that we took initially against you know, the former members of the regime in Baptists actually tended to help justify really this growing insurgency and inflame the situation. That insurgency changed its tactics over time. Remember, he just killed some Americans in the leave. Well, that didn't work. You know, this was the whole Black Hawk Down idea that Saddam had. You know, the, the, then later it was, destroy infrastructure, right? The whole Lenin thing, the worse the better. Grow pools of popular discontent from which the insurgency can draw strength. And then, but, but then Zarqawi, as this, this, or this uh, insurgency morphs now with this alliance of convenience between Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the former regime elements, they, they systematically went after Iraqi security forces because they saw them as a real danger to their strategy. But then ultimately, the strategy became what Zarqawi called the Afghan model. He called it in December of 03. Jump start a civil war. Pit Iraq's communities against each other. And then, then we can portray ourselves as patrons and protectors of one of those parties to the conflict, mainly the Sunni Arab and Turkmen populations. And then commit mass murder against the Shia population, drive them further away from any kind of a political accommodation, invite retribution attacks that can be used as justification, right, for you as a, as a patron and protector. This is essentially the same sort of technique that is being used across, across the region. In, um, in Syria, I think you see the same dynamics. In, uh, in Yemen, you see the same dynamics. In Nigeria, you see the same dynamics in Afghanistan, Pakistan, where, where our enemies, I mean those who are these transnational terrorist organizations, pick communities against each other, and then they use a local conflict, local competitions for power, resources, and survival to gain a foothold as a patron and protector. They establish control through a whole bunch of control mechanisms, intimidation, coercion, and so forth and then solidify their control over people and territory. And so I think we can learn from the evolution of the conflict and our response to that. Now, what is, what is left in Iraq in terms of potential for the kind of fragile political accommodation that set conditions for reversal of the deterioration of that situation in 2007, 2008 remains to be seen. And that's really, you know, really the big political challenge. In, 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 uh, in Ukraine, as a, I think Ukraine is an example of, of the importance of of forward deterrence against a power that is going to, to wage limited war for limited objectives. And I think Jakob Griegel's work on this is probably is extraordinary in terms of really clear thinking uh, about, about, uh, about the problem of, of, uh, of, of Putin, Russia, and, and the use of, of his armed forces there. So limited war for limited objectives, go into Ukraine, take some territory at, at very low cost with very low risk, and then portray the international community's reaction as escalatory. So, how do you cope with that? I would say, you know, I'm in the army, you know, I say one of the ways you do that is forward deterrence, right? You have to ratchet the price up of taking action like that at the frontier, or else it's very difficult to defend against that. And of course, standoff capabilities, joint capabilities have application, but I think we undervalue, you know, deterrent military capabilities at our own peril. And we can make much more dangerous contingencies, uh, you know, apparent. Uh, North Korea, I would well, say, well, is an Before example. you get to North Korea, so yeah. I just want to right. sure. go back to, okay, well, I'll do Ukraine and then I'll go back to, to ISIS. So do you think that the United States or the coalition, or, or not the coalition, the United States or NATO should have armed the Ukrainian military months ago? 
No, well, I can't. I mean, obviously, it's a policy decision. There are all sorts of complicating factors politically. Again, war is an extension of politics. I'm just using it as an example, mm -hmm. you know, of, of really of any power waging limited war from limited objectives in terms of security, stability, preventing conflict for deterrence, you know, is an important element of that kind of a solution. So uh, as, how it applies to, 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 uh, to Ukraine, there are much better experts than me, and obviously this is a policy decision. But. Okay, I understand you can't get into policy decisions, but in terms of ISIS, in terms of fighting ISIS, it, it does seem that a, that a campaign that is limited to coalition airstrikes uh, and whatever military might can be assembled from the Peshmerga, the Free Syrian Army, if there's anyone there who's actually doing anything, and then obviously the Iraqi army, those who are still yeah. willing to go to the front, right. is insufficient. Right, well, I think one of the key things to, to then look at is, you know, what is, you know, how does, how are the continuities in nature we're playing out there? So, for example, if war is an ex extension of politics and we're trying to get to a sustainable political outcome, what are the broad range of actions necessary to be able to get to that political outcome, either, either done by ourselves or, or, through, uh, or through proxy forces and partner forces? Uh, one, of the key, one of the key questions has to do with, you know, with the human dimensions of that conflict. What is the degree to which the Sunni Arab population under such duress having been you know, under, uh, under such uh, terrible conditions for now so long, how can that be pieced back together so you can have Sunni Arab participation in the future security, in their future security, right. and, then, and then a slow reform of, of Iraqi politics and of course you know, Iraqi security institutions such that they have the capability they need but also the legitimacy, and this bleeds over into war as a contest of wills, right? Is the will there uh, among, among forces that we're supporting uh, to, to, be able to, to be able to confront this, this brutal and determined enemy. And I think that we've got, obviously, a great team working on that, a great multinational team working on that with, uh, with new Iraqi leadership and, and, uh, and, and uh, Hader al-Abadi, who I've, I've got a lot of respect for as a person, worked with him over the years there. Of course, he has a tall order. It's complicated further uh, by infiltration and subversion by, uh, into the Iraqi government and security forces by Shia Islamist militias and and those in particular that are beholden to the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps of Iran, uh, which I think has in large measure you know, created the conditions that led to a, a return of large-scale communal conflict in the country. So I mean, I, mean I, don't, I don't know how to sum all this up. It's, it's complicated as hell. It has a lot to do with, I think, our thinking has to be aligned with sort of the continuities and the nature of war, what we want to achieve politically, what is driving the conflict from a human perspective. And you know, people fight for the same fundamental reasons today, right? As, as Thucydides identified 2,500 years ago, fear, sense of honor, and interest, right? What are, what are the drivers of those, those local conflicts across different portions of, of Iraq? Recognizing wars uncertainty, there's gonna be a continuous interaction with this, with this enemy, and recognize especially wars a contest of wills. And I think all of this helps you under, understand what can be achieved through partner forces and, 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 and proxy forces, and maybe what can't, you know, based on what, uh, you know, what political scientists call principal agent problems, you know, that, that, tend to, that tend to be pretty significant in these situations. In terms of North Korea, it's obviously not news to anybody in this room uh, that a cyber attack was pending. Uh, I guess Admiral Rogers uh, here uh, yesterday told my colleague Ian Chudo that the only thing they didn't know was that it would be an attack on a, in a movie studio that actually had such an effect, but these cyber attacks have been going on for quite some time. Uh, how? Could we be better prepared for the future? Do we need to integrate private and public uh, more efficiently? What, where's the weakness there? Right. Well, I mean, I, I defer to, to Admiral Rogers, you know, who's, I think, exactly the right leader at the right time for this very complicated problem set. And within the Army, uh, General Ed Cardone is, 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 is our lead. For, our, for the Army, what we're looking at is really hard. What are the tactical implications of, of, of the cyber, uh, of cyberspace? And, and uh, what do we need to achieve in, in context of what we in the Army are calling joint combined arms operations, really how we're gonna operate in the future in this game of rock, paper, scissors, and what kind of cyber tools do we need? And so essentially, we have to try to be able to do three things in, in cyberspace to support, I think, what we're doing militarily. The, the first of these is we, we've gotta obviously defend our own, our own networks and our capabilities. And, and this again gets to this continuous interaction with the enemy, right? Our enemies, our enemies will do four essential things to us, I think, in the future. The first of these is they will evade our capabilities, right? So if you think you're going to have an answer, quick answer to the problem of future war, I mean, enemies will evade that, and especially on land. I mean, land warfare is different, right? Because, I mean, well, people live there. It complicates things. You know, geography complicates things. Uh, in, on land, it's not really a targeting exercise. I mean, I, I think uh, on land you have 
typically tens of thousands of so-called targets, which they're not their people, all of whom are trying to avoid being classified as such, right? So you have, you have them taking sort of countermeasures uh, to evade your capabilities of dispersion, concealment, intermingling with civilian population, deception. The second thing I think we'll see is enemies disrupting our capabilities. And this is where cyber attacks, I think, are a big threat. But also other capabilities, you know, UAV type capabilities, maybe swarm capabilities with autonomous and semi-autonomous systems, long-range precision munitions tied to set commercially available satellite imagery, uh, weapons of mass destruction. I mean, these are all things, EMP type capabilities. These are things that can really disrupt what they see as our asymmetrical advantages. So evade, disrupt. The third thing is they're going to emulate our capabilities. And I think that there's a school of thought out there that we can maintain our differential advantage as a military force, as a joint force, by, you know, by, by investing in, in high-end technologies. And that will, that, will deliver, that will deliver our capabilities in the future. But I think you could make the argument that technology is the most transferable element of our, technology, of our differential advantage to our, to our enemies. So I think we're gonna see more and more emulation in cyber uh, and in other areas. And then the fourth area is our enemies will, will, will go, go into other battlegrounds. They'll expand into other battlegrounds. And, and those battlegrounds are cyberspace, certainly. I think space and, and the air, maritime domains, are going to be a lot more challenged than they have in the past. We've been able to achieve and maintain su supremacy there. And, and, so, and, and we're also going to see that, um, you know, th that uh, 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 expansion into battlegrounds of, of uh, political infiltration, subversion, and so forth. So cyber, we have to protect our ability to operate. We have to, u we have to use cyber better to better understand our enemies, how they're operating, what are their sources of strength, what are their vulnerabilities. And this is you know, big data type tool sets, but it's also you know, really understanding social media and the dynamics there. I mean, if you look at, a, at what this uh, team at the Institute for the Study of War does to advance our understanding of a very complex situation in, in Syria and Iraq, it's astounding. And it, they're getting it all off social media, you know, and then, and then so, the, so understanding is the third, and the third is to, is to conduct offensive operations in cyberspace to limit the enemy's ability to use it. So I think cyberspace is analogous to those other domains where you want to ensure your own freedom of movement and action in those domains, whether it's the maritime, air, space domain, land, uh, but, and want to restrict the enemy's freedom of, of movement and action. So what are the tools at the tactical level that we need to do that? We're developing those. I think if you look at military innovation, I think people will look back at this period years from now and look at Army Cyber Command as an example of, uh, of well-executed innovation. And I, and I think uh, General Cardone, as I mentioned, is, he is doing a tremendous job and a very, very uh, you know, a, a, a very forward-looking effort to develop that capability within our Army. I have a lot more questions, but I also know that we only have 17 minutes and 17 seconds. So uh, I will uh, open up the floor and uh, just uh, I'll call on you uh, if you could stand up, uh, state your name, and when you're, if you're with a publication or, or a media organization, state that, and then you can go ahead. I'll, I'll start with you in the front row. Is there a microphone or? Here we go. Thank you very much. Patrick Tucker from Defense One. So, General, the other day at the Defense Writers Groups, you. You were talking about um, what happened in Iraq and the failure of the Iraqi government to consolidate gains and how this was something that eventually led to a power vacuum that was eventually filled in part by ISIS. You don't write policy, you've made that very clear. Um, <laughs> the most recent authorization for the use of force in Iraq, uh, it, there's nothing in it that speaks to consolidating gains. Uh, there's a small carve out for some special operations. Um, to your mind, uh, We've since then said that we're, we are going to train like a group of 20,000 uh, Iraqi security forces, Kurds, um, to move into Mosul. So that seems like a potential place for some gained consolidation, but to your mind, knowing that you don't write policy, does the most current version of the authorization proposal that's coming around make room to um, attack this problem the way you would attack it? Well, well, I mean, I, I think the key thing is, is that there, there obviously is, there is a requirement to consolidate gains. And this is one of the things that we highlight in the Army Operating Concept. If you just Google Army Operating Concept, it's a real page turner if you want to read about the Army's uh, view of the problem of future armed conflict. I have it right here. <laughs> if anybody wants and, to Xerox uh, And I'd, prefer, I'd, I'd really welcome any, any feedback you have uh, on it. But, but we talk about the need for consolidation of gains. And I think this is a, one of those clear, you know, important lessons, you know, from the last 13 years of war. Now, 
Now, who consolidates gains? I mean, it, it shouldn't matter as long as you're getting to that sustainable political outcome consistent with your interests. And, and what's necessary to consolidate gains? Well, it always has been you know, military support to indigenous security forces who take on increasing you know, responsibility, the development of security forces that are capable, but also legitimate, you know, entrusted by the population. It's mil military support to governance and rule of law consistent with the traditions and what that, and, and of that society and the history of that society so that you can deny the enemy really the ability to operate freely amongst those populations. Now, if you could say, well, that sounds like you know, reinvention of Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, I mean, I think that the lesson of Iraq and Afghanistan, what we learn is going to be super important. And, and I, I, my, I personally believe the lesson is that, that, that we, uh, we did not do it the way we could have done it. I mean, we could have done it more effectively, um, but we, because we didn't plan for it effectively, because we didn't, didn't recognize that this was an enduring requirement in a post-conflict uh, situation, we were unable to consolidate gains effectively, and that created opportunities uh, for our enemies to, to gain strength. And we can go into more detail about both if you'd like later. But, so, but, the, but the lesson for today is somebody has to consolidate gains. And we've always had to do it. If you look across our history, American military forces, except in conflicts where the political objective was very narrowly circumscribed, we've had to, we've had to consolidate gains. The commander in chief likes to go boy, girl, boy, girl. I'll, I'll follow uh, his lead if there's a woman who wants to ask a question. You are definitely not a woman. Yes, ma'am, back there. <laughs> so you should, have, you should have come and drag is what you should have done. I want to hear a question asked. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Aaron Simpson from Karis Associates. Uh, HR, you've talked a lot about the enduring nature of, of warfare this morning. I wonder if you could highlight some of those things you think are definitely changing and both where the Army and where the Joint Force more broadly needs to adapt to account for those changes. Well, those, those, are, those are great questions. Okay, so, so what, what is changing? I think, I think the way we're thinking about future wars is in four key areas, right? A lot of fours we use in, in uh, training and doctrine command. The first of those is threats, enemies, and adversaries in future operating environments. What is, what is changing about that? I mentioned some of this already, uh, that, that uh, we see the outlines of that today. I think we've seen harbingers of future conflict in connection with you know, the so-called hybrid enemies, but networked enemy organizations that have the capabilities previously associated only with nation states and can do those four things, right? They can av avoid our capabilities, disrupt our, our, our capabilities, um, they, they can emulate our capabilities and expand onto other onto other battlegrounds, you know, the so-called hybrid warfare of Russia uh, or, or the very sophisticated, you know, sort of political subversion and infiltration that you see maybe the IRGC and its related uh, organizations uh, conduct in the greater Middle East. So I think, so that's what we have to be prepared for in terms of threats, enemies, and adversaries. The, the, and I'll talk about technology a little separately. Mis missions, what kind of missions are we going to have to conduct in, in the future? There's been a lot really discussed about uh, enemy anti-access area denial type capabilities, and that is significant. So part of our missions, I think, are going to be to ensure our freedom of maneuver and action in increasingly contested environments and across all domains. So for the Army, the implication is that we'll have to conduct operations on land for what you always need an Army for, right, which is to defeat enemy organizations, to establish control of territory, to do what? Well, to deny its use to the enemy oftentimes but also to consolidate gains to get to sustainable political outcomes. But increasingly, army forces, I think, are gonna to have to operate in a way where we can then project power outward from land into the maritime, air, space, and cyber domains to ensure our freedom of movement and action in those domains and then restrict the enemy's activities there. I think the other key mission is we're gonna see a lot of bad things that can be delivered at long range emanating from enemy territory and increasingly urban areas. And you know, Dave Kilcullen I saw here today, uh, you know, wrote a great book about you know, increasing urbanization and threats that emanate from urban. So, so why do we care about urban areas? Well, I mean, we care because what, of what would, could draw us there. Terrorist safe havens and support bases, long range ballistic missile capabilities, tied to weapons of mass destruction, cities as launching pads, essentially. So for the Army, I think that we're gonna have to conduct what we call expeditionary maneuver. And that's rapidly deploying forces, into unexpected locations to maybe bypass anti-access. But that can't be a force that just gets there. It's got to be a force that has mobility, protection, and lethality to get the, get the job done, that can tr transition quickly. 
And then the third area that we're thinking about is technology. Some technologies that we're developing will give us those kind of expeditionary maneuver capabilities. I and mean, this is demand reduction, power and energy technologies. You know, we, we, uh, we are working hard on our, our ballistic missile defense type capabilities and our air defense type capabilities. We're integrating autonomous and semi-autonomous systems so that the forces that we want to deploy in the future for the Army, we want those forces to really be able to operate widely dispersed with decentralized capabilities, but to do that while maintaining what we call mutual support, right? So you're not trying to create multiple little bighorns simultaneously, right? You want, you want to be able to fight together and to support each other. Essentially, what we're thinking about is air ground joint teams is elevating the tactics of infiltration to the operational level. To operate dispersed, but be able to concentrate against enemies. To be able to defeat those enemies and then be able to establish control of, of territories, all in the context of joint operations. Technology is going to help us do that, but we have to recognize what enemy technologies are, and we have to recognize countermeasures to our technologies. Again, rock, you know, rock, paper, scissors, right? Submarine sonar, bomber, radar, machine gun, tank, tank, anti-tank missile, right? There's no silver bullet in this game, okay? It's combinations of capabilities. And then the final thing that we look at is, is history and, and lessons learned, because we think that the way to think about the future, Aaron, is to, to walk backward into it, like the ancient Greeks, right? To pay attention to what's going on these days. So, so I think that, uh, I, you know, I ask you to participate in, in our armies thinking about future war. Sir Michael Howard said, hey, you're going to be wrong. No matter how well you think about future war, you're just going to be wrong. The key is to not be so far off the mark that you can't adjust to the real demands of conflict once they're revealed to you. So how do you do that? I think you do that by, you know, by, by asking the right questions. Thank you. And so what we've tried to do in our Army is, is establish a framework of 20 questions. These are first order questions, the answers to which will improve current and future force combat effectiveness. These are, these are portrayed as first order capabilities in Annex B of the highly readable Army operating concept. And, and, uh, and, and, and these are enduring problems for the Army and this is really for this group, we would love to work with all of you on, on, on how well we think we can do that and, and how each of those challenges, meet those challenges, and how we might be able to do it better in the future. Jen, I, we have eight minutes left. I, I, just a quick follow-up, if you could give succinctly if possible so we can get to some more questions. Give me a hypothetical of what you're talking about when you talk about bad things emanating from an urban environment. What, what exactly okay. is, is, a, is sure. a, a realistic idea of what you're talking yeah. about? I think there are some historical analogies that we ought to keep in mind. The V1 and V2 threat to London in World War II. The, uh, the Scud missile threat out of the western desert of Iraq in 1991, the threat to, to Israel. The, uh, the, the, the threat of rockets from Gaza is, 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 and from, from southern Lebanon to Israel is analogous as well. I think we're going to see more and more of that, where you have long-range weapon systems that threaten us and our allies. And so this A2AD capability is very important, but we've defined it in a way that, that really it's just to keep us out, right? Because remember, we're so bad, right? But it's also an offensive threat. It's a coercive threat. And so just as you couldn't solve any of those other historical long-range weapons capability, those threats in the past by standoff capabilities alone, I think that, that you're not going to be able to do it in the future either. So in our Army's future force development, that's why we're emphasizing two really elements of the concept, expeditionary maneuver and joint combined arms operations. Okay, the gentleman in the green sweater has been very patient, and the green turtleneck in the red sweater has been very patient. I'm Harlan Ullman, HR. That was a brilliant summary of warfare. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask you a career-ending question, so be prepared. Uh, you talked about... I'm overdue, Harlan. I think. No, you're not. you you got a long way to go, HR. Um, if you were to update Dereliction of Duty, which for those of you who haven't read it, was a stunning critique of Vietnam in terms of continuity and change today in 14 years of war, what might you have to say if you're prepared to say anything? Well, I mean, the, the, book, the book I wrote was about, uh, you know, which is also a real page turner, too, by the way, for anybody who's in it, was, uh, it was, 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 a, was about uh, how and why Vietnam became an American war and how decisions were made that led to an American war in Vietnam. And, and from the research, I was able to identify really problems that, that undermined our ability to think clearly about the problem set in Vietnam and develop a strategy. And, and it resulted really in a situation in which we went to war without a, without a clear strategy, without a, a, an ability to connect what we were doing militarily to sustainable political outcomes there. And it led also to a failure to consider long-term costs and consequences as a result of a number of factors. Uh, one was, uh, was a difficult civil-military relationship. Uh, I, you know, there, there's blame on, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, as well, who 
um, who actually compromise principle for expediency in some cases or for corporateness. Uh, this, 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 some of these problems you know, re then led to the Goldwater Nichols Act. There's a much different civil military dynamic, a different way that civilian leaders can gain access to military advice. But I think the bottom line is, hey, what's the role of the military in these sort of situations? I mean, it's, your role is to give your best military advice, right? And not cross the line between advice and advocacy of, of policy. Nobody likes generals, right? I mean, to make policy. I mean, we, that, we would escape. Uh, you know, sort of a responsibility to the American public. It's our civilian officials who, who have that responsibility. So that's what we owe, and that's why for military officers, we have to be able to think clearly about future war. We have to study it in width, depth, and context. We, we will benefit tremendously from forums like this and from the tremendous knowledge and experience that's brought together here. And so, uh, so I think for, for me, you know, really what I want to emphasize with, inside of our Army, and, and this is consistent with General Odierno, who you're going to have a real treat of hearing from him uh, tomorrow, is you know, his number one priority is leader development. And, and that's leader development so that we can do what we need to do tactically in, you know, in the Korongal Valley, right? And in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the great story that, that, uh, that Jake told, we have to be able to conduct fire and maneuver, combined arms operations. We have to be able to defeat our enemies in close combat. And we have to develop those core competencies in our junior officers. But from the very early time, our officers and NCOs have got to be thinking about how do you connect what you're doing to that, to that political outcome? And that might sound crazy, but I think, I think it, what we owe our soldiers and a test of good strategy is, can you answer this question? Can you explain to your soldiers how the risks that they're taking and the sacrifices they're making are contributing to an outcome worthy of those risks and worthy of those sacrifices? And so I think we could become better at strategy. We have to be better at communicating it. We have to be better at communicating the nature of the conflicts we're in. I mean, how many Americans could name the three Taliban groups that were fighting in Afghanistan, even? So it's tough to generate the kind of understanding across our, our nation, uh, but, but then also even within our, our military oftentimes on who we're fighting, what, what are the stakes, right? Why is this worth it? And then how, how what is, is what we're doing uh, going to get to that sustainable and worthy outcome? I mean, I believe that we are, you know, I, don't, I mean, we are engaged in, in sort of righteous causes right now, okay? Um, and I think it's okay uh, for us to want to win against these, uh, th these, uh, you know, the, these misogynistic, murderous bastards that we're fighting uh, in, the, in the greater Middle East. And so, so I, I think that uh, we ought to be unabashed about it, and we ought, to, we ought to really define what winning is, okay? It's not a MacArthur-esque lifting of all restrictions on force, uh, but it is a rational determination to succeed and it's a clear idea of how what we're doing militarily is connected, right, to all the other elements of national power that are directed at achieving that sustainable and worthy outcome. So, so I think if there's a big lesson that you can take from, from really across multiple conflicts is, is the clarity in our strategic thinking and planning is something that we can all work on, you know, across civil military teams, multinational teams. I think I heard in there a very diplomatic answer to what, you're, to what you asked, and I'm looking forward to the next book, presumably after you retire. Um, uh, we have time for one more question. Is there a woman that has a question in the boy, girl, boy, girl? It's right here, actually. I'm sorry? It's right, right behind this silver-haired gentleman. Oh, there you are. Okay. Right My name is Martina Vandenberg. I'm an international human rights lawyer. And this, this panel is called Continuities and Change in Future Armed Conflict. But I'm wondering, as you talk about strategy and as you develop the sort of tactics of the future, what's the role of international law? Is international law keeping up? Are there discussions about this? What about the Geneva Conventions and how we're training our future war fighters to actually fight in a way that's consistent with international law? Right. Well, you bring up a really, a really great point. I think, I think uh, international law is behind, based on the natures uh, of the enemies who we've been fighting. But I think that really what's important is, is moral, ethical, and psychological preparation of soldiers and units uh, for combat in these very complicated environments, environments where the enemies intermingle with civilian populations, and in these environments of persistent danger. So I think, I think legal uh, sort of restrictions on the use of force are super important, obviously, right? Because they are what helps make war less inhumane, right? But also, you know, it, we have to go beyond that. We have to inculcate into our soldiers our values in our army, our warrior ethos, because it is that warrior ethos that, that allows you to, you know, to operate effectively in these complex environments. And the story that's been untold, I think, 
about the wars both in Iraq and Afghanistan is how many times every day do our soldiers take on greater risk and our Marines take on greater risk uh, so that they can protect civilians, you know? And so, so I think that, that what we have done is inculcated into our force really an understanding of the importance of moral, ethical, and psychological preparation for combat. And that, that is, you know, from a, you know, the ethical pre preparation is, is really building across our army. What do we expect of each other? What do you expect of the soldier, the man or woman next to you, in terms of their conduct in combat, vis-a-vis -vis civilians, vis-a-vis -vis the enemy, captured enemy, right? And we have to do this from kind of a John Stuart Mill kind of utilitarian perspective, right? That every time you, you, know, you take action in a, in a way that's against your values, you might as well be working for the enemy, right? But also from a Kantian sort of man as an ends and, and a recognition of, 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 our, uh, of our values and that we can't violate our values or we may have lost already, right? So, so it, I think our army is very focused on this. I know all of our services are very focused on moral, ethical, and psychological preparation. A lot of this is also education. It's, it's uh, about learning about the histories and the cultures of the regions. I think a deliberate effort to cultivate empathy is very important as you go into these very complicated environments. And, uh, and, and I think that uh, we've made tremendous progress on it, but we, we have to continuously get better at it. So um, I think it's a great question. I think our legal frameworks are, are, are dated. Our enemies know how to operate around them in so-called lawfare and so forth. Uh, but, but I think that what's equally important is, is, is uh, or maybe even more important, is, is moral and ethical preparation, as, as well as understanding the legal constraints and standards in terms of uh, soldier behavior in combat. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant General McMaster. It was uh, really great hearing from you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you.